Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to my capstone presentation, which will be on the power dependent light harvesting dynamics of these cyanobacteria cystis species PCC6803 and its native uh, thylakoid membrane environment. So, cyanobacteria are a bacteria uh, that are small, like little aquatic things known as uh, blue green algae sometimes, although they're not actually related to algae. Uh, they do bloom similarly to algae though, as is shown in like this picture over here. Uh, and fun fact, the contamination in Lake Austin right now is actually caused by cyanobacteria, so don't let your dogs in there. Um, but that's not what we're currently studying. Cyanobacteria are an extremely old form of bacteria, known to be as old as 3.5 billion years old, and um, some researchers theorize that they played a critical role in the oxygen revolution, and they're also a considerable source of nitrogen. Uh, what we want to know, though, is how sand bacteria are able to harvest light energy. Next. There we go. So some of the reasons that we chose to study sand bacteria rather than other similar organisms, such as uh, algae and green plants, is that they're more easily grown in a lab. Um, they're much smaller than green plants and algae, and therefore they have less scattered light. And uh, also some of these other organisms have like flagella, so whenever you're trying to like wash them, they'll swim away from you, which isn't great. Uh, <laughs> Sanos also have an extensively studied genome, making it easier to mutate. Uh, we use these deletions to simplify the Sanos uh, light harvesting machinery even further, so we could only have like photosystem one or photosystem two. Um, and in my personal work, I have largely focused on uh, the mechanisms of photosystem one. Additionally, we believe that the better and or we believe that the better understanding of cyanobacteria uh, and how they're able to trap excitations for photosynthesis can provide uh, some beneficial information on advancing research in solar energy. So, um, in general, light harvesting works by collecting excitations with their peripheral antenna, turning those excitations to the core antenna, and finally trapping those excitations at a reaction center where they're uh, sent off to be used as energy. This is also referred to as quenching by the reaction center. Um, and in cyanobacteria, the antenna known as phycobilosomes, which are these you know, very literal antenna <laughs> looking dudes, uh, uh, they first capture energy there in the most hour pieces of the phycobilosomes, and then they transfer it down to the core antenna, which in turn send these excitations to the photosystem one trimer, uh, where they'll bounce around a bit until they're quenched by a reaction center. Uh, as I previously stated, they uh, bacteria have photosystem ones, which are arranged in sets of trimers, as we can see on the left here. Uh, each of these photosystems are filled with 96 chlorophylls, which are pigments that are crucial to the photosynthesis process and basically every photosynth photosynthetic organism. Uh, one special pair of these chlorophylls, known as the reaction center, is where these excitations are trapped and accepted by the organism to be used for other processes. Uh, however, we don't care a ton about what happens after that, considering we're just looking at how the excitations move through the system before they are trapped. Um, initially, an excitation will be funneled into one of these monomers, but that does not necessarily mean that is where it will be trapped, as excitations are capable of bouncing around from one monomer to another, um, as well as even potentially to another trimer. So another thing that we have to consider when looking at some bacteria's light harvesting systems is how these trimers are packed together. Um, and over here, we can see an example of how photosystem one trimers are packed in a different cyanobacteria than the one we're studying, but generally photosystem ones are densely packed together in a geometric fashion. Uh, our goal when looking at this is to ultimately determine the path an excitation takes from when it first enters a photosystem to where it is eventually trapped by a reaction center. Uh, so another thing that we looked at whenever we were studying this is something called annihilation. Annihilation is basically what occurs if two like excitations run into each other. So here we have like kind of a little like photosystem one trimer, basically. And we have our two yellow dots, which we'll say are excitations. So say they were, were to both move to this bottom left trimer. Um, they would both jump there, we kind of get like a little pulse. And then one of them basically gets deleted and we only have one left when the other returns to the ground state. And uh, by looking at these annihilation rates, especially at different powers, we can determine a little bit more about what's happening in these photosystems. Uh, also known as pump probe spectroscopy, transient electron absorption spectroscopy, 
lets us uh, look at the system by first probing it, and then sometime later, uh, ex or uh, first exciting it with the pump signal and later probing it after some time that we choose, which allows us to see the state of that system at that instance in time. Um, moreover, we're taking several probes at different time intervals or delays, uh, we can see what happens to the absorption of the system over time. Uh, over here, we have a single transient absorption spectra. We get a few pieces of information from the spectrum, namely uh, ground state bleach, excited state absorption, and simulated emission. So ground state bleach occurs when a photon is absorbed, creating excitation, sending that point in the system from the ground state S0 to the first excited state S1. And then next we have excited state absorption, which is what happens to a system excited by the pump signal and it goes to an even higher state. Um, and that's basically just, you know, whenever we first hit it with the first laser, that's what happens to it. And then lastly, we have simulated emission, which is when the system relaxes from the S1 state back down to the ground state. And this is what will happen uh, when we hit the uh, system with the propulse, essentially forcing it back down to the ground state. Uh, together, these show us how absorption occurs in relation to wavelength, and this is one way uh, that we can determine the path that's taken uh, as we observe shifts in these peaks over time. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, TEAS is able to work on the order of femtoseconds. It's not letting me, there we go. Um, femtoseconds, which is one quadrillionth of a second, so very, very, very fast. Uh, here we have kind of a schematic of our transient electron absorption spectroscopy system. And uh, okay, there. basically, so the first thing we have up here is the titanium sapphire laser, which was five kilohertz. And this is where we get our, you know, laser beams from in the first place. We first send it through a filter just to uh, kind of trim down that a little bit. And then through argon, which gives us a broadband spectrum, which is kind of more like white light than just whatever a spectra the laser initially emits at. Um, the next thing that happens to it is it goes over here to a beam slitter and this is where we get our separate pump beam and our probe beam. Uh, the probe beam we don't do very much with, the pump beam we kind of have to mess with a little bit so we can get the time delays that we want. So we have a motorized stage that we have a couple mirrors set on and we can basically change the distance of this and that will change the time delay between uh, the pump signal and the probe signal later. We also have an optical chopper, which is 2.5 kilohertz. So that's basically the power of this beam. We could just basically block it for every other signal. And then we could just get like some probe only data and we could also get like the pump and probe data together more or less. So um, basically this isn't a continuous beam. We did a, uh, pump from our pump beam that goes into the sample. And then after the delay that we want, we get to the probe beam and that's when we can get like an observation of the sample. So something we needed to make sure that we considered was where our laser emits light versus where our sand bacteria absorbs light. Uh, this is an emission spectra of our laser. As you can see, it largely emits around like 700 nanometers, but it also stretches all the way down to 600 nanometers or so. And then now we can see this is where our cyanobacteria generally absorbs light, which is more around, it's still like kind of near 700, but it's a little bit lower and it doesn't quite overlap with our peak here. So what we had to do is we needed to see what is that overlap? Like, and this is our uh, photons absorbed by the system. This is where uh, the system basically accepts the light from our laser the most. And we actually uh, look at this peak right here and that's where we get most of our uh, observations from is that nanometer wavelength. And so here we have a pump probe spectra which compares the intensity of absorbance over time versus wavelength. Uh, we're then able to find the highest intensity portion of this graph which is for in this case at 689 nanometers. And then we take this like line basically, and we turn it into a different graph, which is just uh, our intensity versus time. So we can see the decay of the signal over time. Um, and this was just one that was done at a lower power, but we can also plot our multiple powers over time and see the difference there. 
so here we can see a few different decay time traces. As I mentioned before, we want to look at these versus power, uh, which here I've converted to excitations per monomer, which is basically how many of those little dots that I mentioned in every one of those. So uh, we can see here that at lower powers, which are these two up here, and they're kind of overlapping, uh, uh, we can see that they decayed a little bit slower, whereas the higher powers had a faster time decay, which is likely due to the like, higher rates of annihilation. Uh, let's go ahead and look at this in a table though instead. So we definitely observed a decrease in decay times as the powers were increased. Um, and this is due to the fact that at higher powers, there are more excitations from monomer, which in turn leads to higher rates of annihilation. Um, and because this is to a by exponential, we have two distinct time scales, which could represent two different uh, decay pathways, such as annihilation and fluorescence. Um, at 691 nanometers, we see the same trend in both of these time constants, where it decreases as the number of excitations per monomer increases up to 1.27 excitations per monomer. Uh, however, we actually see an increase in the decay time at just over two excitations per monomer, and we don't know exactly why that is yet. Uh, one potential explanation for this is that there is a cap after which the annihilation is occurring at a high enough rate that increasing the number of excitation doesn't really do anything to the system anymore without photo bleaching it at least. Um, or perhaps there's some system in place to combat highlight conditions and somehow slows down hopping times or something, but ultimately we would need to look at um, more annihilation simulations to determine this. Uh, another term that we observed was wavelength dependence. Uh, here we see that at uh, 0.35 excitations per monomer, the faster decay times are at more central wavelengths or those that were closer to like that center of the pulse we looked at earlier where it was at, like about 690. Um, these also have the strongest fits and we see that the further out the wavelengths have like a much weaker fit, which means that they may not have as much of a correlation to the decay times uh, because it's just not where the power is. Uh, one theory that we have about this is that the redder chlorophylls may play a role in determining wavelength dependence. And uh, red chlorophylls are essentially just chlorophylls that absorb light at redder wavelengths than typical chlorophylls. And while it hasn't been fully determined, it is theorized that red chlorophylls are located in more peripheral locations of the monomers. And they might also assist in transfer between the monomers in order to protect them from photo bleaching at higher light conditions. And uh, we actually kind of look at both of these tables together. So we have like wavelength dependence versus power dependence, but I didn't want to give you guys like a 20 by 20 graph to look at. So from here, there are several directions that this research could go in the future. Uh, first and foremost, we actually are in talks with other researchers, uh, Siddhartha Suhani and Nikita uh, Onuzik, to have them take our annihilation data and run some simulations on them, which as I mentioned earlier, could help determine like what are the actual decay tasks taken by the excitations. Um, another thing that we looked at a little bit but didn't focus on are uh, the photosystem two dimers of cyanobacteria, which actually have like some different like systems in place. And I think they have like something to do with like oxygen production or something, but it wasn't my focus of my study, but we do have some data on that. And potentially somebody could take, uh, you know, all the coding that I did and like labored on for photosystem one and apply that to seeing what's happening in this dimer. And uh, finally, another direction that I think would be really interesting to look at is uh, the light harvesting patterns of plagabilisms, uh, both halide funnel energy and halide transfer energy to the photosystems. But uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to look at these due to them causing too much light scattering. So we basically weren't able to use them, but they could potentially be looked at with another method or possibly if equipment advances in the future, I think it would be you know, really interesting to know how these wacky little antenna will actually work. Um, I want to say thank you to Dr. Massey for, you know, guiding me so much throughout this research. You know, this is both of our first capstone experiences, so she's been a wonderful help throughout all of this. And also thank you to the uh, Southwestern Chemistry Department just for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, we also want to give thanks to two other researchers, Dr. Sarah Sohail and Dr. Pete Dahlberg. Dr. Sarah Sohail actually did a thesis on a, some of this, but it kind of like let me take on the rest of this is kind of like continue this research further. And Dr. Pete Dahlberg ran some uh, simulations on annihilations in a different uh, system, like a bacteria. And I was able to use that to make kind of my own code for finding some of this. And of course, and I thank the Walsh Foundation for our funding. Did anybody have any questions? Thank you, Lexi. Let's see, any questions? Okay, Dr. Wiegand. 
So Lexi, right at the end, you said uh, some, some improved instrumentation could be used to further the research. What, what would that involve? I'm not sure exactly what would have to be done, but I just think there would need to be some sort of way to combat the light scattering, just because whenever that happens, we aren't able to absorb what's happening. We kind of just get like things that are all over the place. Like we have an absorbent spectra, like uh, we actually do some research with diatoms and we get high scattering. It basically just looks like this when it's supposed to look like this. So you just really can't tell what's going on. So we would need something that either is more fine tuned or I'm not even sure if it's possible with this type of instrumentation. I just think like, maybe some other future research would allow us to actually look at this without having that same problem with light scattering. Because I know it's not only an issue for this system, it's an issue with a lot of things. Like when you have light scattering, it just kind of makes the research impossible to be done with this instrument. Okay, thanks. Dr. Niemeyer. Hi, Lexi, thank you for your talk. Um, it was really interesting. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, can we go back to that spectrum that shows your laser output. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I understand the, oops, wait, I understand the laser spectrum. I understand the absorbance. So let me first ask, what is the WT6803? That is that is an abbreviation for the, the uh, same bacteria. It's wild type 6803 because it's species 6803. Um, it's actually probably would be slightly different for, for the system one, but I just, this is kind of more okay. representative thing than particular. Okay. So, um, and I understand I see the absorbance spectrum of mm -hmm. that cyanobacteria. So just so I understand, like, are these, you're essentially measuring, you're doing pump probe experiments on what, like a, like a certain concentration of these critters, like contained in a cuvette. Like, so I, I don't understand what you're doing the pump probe experiments on. Like, how do you, What's your sample look like actually when you're doing kind of these experiments? Like, not exactly like this. It would kind of look like a one of these things on the right. We have like basically, yeah, kind of like what you said, like a sample of these, and we just kind of like excited and left. I actually didn't do these myself because this is like, like I said, Dr. Sarah Sohale was the original researcher so, along with Dr. Massey in grad school, but I kind of taken the data and run with it. More than okay, I got you. So you weren't doing because I was like, God, do we have a pump probe set up? It's no, we don't. I don't know about that. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, so um, but I, I think so, Lexi can answer more about like what what is the sample, right? Like, are we looking at cells? Are we looking at some part of the cell? Oh, yeah. like, what, what is it that we're looking at here? Basically, we are looking at like a kind of like a sample of the cells and like they're in their native membrane environment. So. A lot of research has been done on this before, just on like the photosynthesis by itself, but we wanted to look at it more in its native like thylakoid membrane environment. So we're kind of looking at like a little like portion of this, like, not of like cells, but I guess like it's in the cell. So, so mem membrane fragments, right? Yeah, so membrane the fragments. The phycobills okay. are falling off. And so we're looking at membrane fragments of the thylakoid membrane that have the photosystems embedded in them. Okay, I gotcha. I, so I just, maybe I don't understand the terminology, but I don't understand how photons absorbed is different than the absorbent spectrum. These are obviously not the same thing, but I don't understand why the photons absorbed is different than the absorbent spectrum. Like why is that red shifted? That's just kind of what we decided to call like the overlap of these. Basically it's like, if we have this laser spectrum and this is where um, our organism like will absorb, where are the photons from this laser absorbed? So it's basically looking at like that overlap, like whenever we actually hit it with the laser, where were the photons from that laser absorbed versus it's just like the uh, wild type absorbance. It's just like in general, where does this organism absorb? And I, I know it's kind of weird that it doesn't overlap, but I think it just has to do with the fact that we're like using a laser that is redshifted. So that causes the like actual photons absorbed to be more redshifted. So Lexi, the, the absorbance here is the UV vis absorbance, right? Mm -hmm. And what were we trying to figure out with doing these calculations, right? These calculations were a huge contribution that you made to this project. And so what were we trying to get at here? Uh, I had to like explain that. So basically we wanted to see like, whenever we excited it with a laser, like how many, photons are absorbed 
at what wavelengths as well as like how many are absorbed at different powers. And that was part of what I had looked at. I'm not sure if that's what you were looking for. Okay. Maybe you can relate this to then um, the number of uh, the fraction of complexes excited or the yeah excitations per complex that you put on the other graphs. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. That is. Yeah. We got from that. that sorry, I didn't quite understand that. That's what you're asking about. Yeah. So here's what kind of what that is. It's like we uh, this is like a power dependent, but we're able to see that like um basically how many monomers are excited or how many excitations are there within a monomer like dependent on like when we excite it. I'm not sure if that answers your question, Dr. Niemeyer. So what I, I guess I don't understand is that the absorbance spectrum of these things shouldn't change, right? Unless they're under some different conditions, like something's absorbance max is, 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 is its absorbance max, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Unless it's dissolved in a different solvent or something causes it to redshift. So um, I, I guess maybe I'm starting to understand, but I, I don't understand why the it wouldn't absorb a maximum number of photons at its absorbance max. Is there, is there some reason that it's the photons absorbed is, doesn't more closely overlay its absorbance spectrum? I mean, is it the like local conditions or I just, do you know what I mean? I would think normally the photons like, that are absorbed. Okay, so I guess the way to explain this is like, it's not necessarily like, where the photons like if this was like an even like we just had like an even like line that we absorbed this like excited with like this many excitations like over all these like wavelengths it would probably be exactly the same but because we're giving it like more photons at higher uh, wavelengths this is how many photons are actually absorbed at that wavelength based on where our uh, laser is emitting so that's what it means are like okay. photons absorbed, like this many photons were absorbed here. This is not like just like if it were like natural light, where it would absorb. Does that make more sense? Okay. Sorry, I was like having a hard time like finding the words to like communicate. Yeah, that. I just couldn't understand why those didn't more closely overlay mm -hmm. one another, but I think that makes sense to me now. Thank you. No problem.